What if it was your job to keep an eye on the things that go bump in the night? Well, that's what security guards do. Watch over places and things when there's supposed to be no one around. When you're that alert and alone in a mysterious place, it's almost a guarantee you'll see something nightmare-inducing. Enjoy these 10 extremely disturbing confessions from security guards. And let me know in the comments what you think the scariest job would be. And don't forget to like this video or dislike if that's your thing. Thank you. Number one, Stable Security by Argos. A couple of summers ago, I worked as a stable hand on a farm just off a main road that led into town. The farm used to be a safe haven for illegal immigrants to squat in outside of Chicago, but it's been restored since then. Up until this point, I had mostly worked cleaning out horse stalls, taking the cattle in and out of the pasture, and making sure all the animals had food and water. One day, my boss, let's call him JC, asked me to stay late to watch over the stable while he attended a horse race in a nearby town. I accepted, of course. Otherwise, this would be quite the boring story to tell. I ended up stocking up on snacks and bought an entire two liter of soda to keep in the old gator cart we had in the barn. I drove around the property a few times to make sure everyone had gone home for the night, then brought the remaining horses inside before I decided to head inside myself and take a break and eat some dinner. I was a regular makeshift security guard and it was kind of fun, at least for a while. Right away, I knew something was wrong. When I found the large doors leading into the section of the barn JC's horses were in, wide open. I didn't see anyone inside and I had initially assumed my boss had come back early. So I parked the gator outside, blocking the exit so if anybody was sneaking around, they'd have to climb over. I looked around for about 20 minutes, coming up with nothing but I did notice that the pen in the barn that the goats were kept in was open and the goats had escaped. A couple of the goats were still in the pen, but the rest had made their escape. I now made it my duty to wrangle the rest of the goats before my boss returned. Otherwise, I'd be in a heap of trouble. As I walked about the rest of the barn and stable, I managed to find and chase back all but one of the goats I had no clue where the last one was before I suddenly heard a loud crash from the kitchen area of the attached offices. I headed over, but strangely enough, I could hear something else. It sounded like one of the goats had tried to run out the still open barn doors. I raced over as fast as I could, only to catch what looked like a pair of rather large Hispanic men climbing over the gator I'd left parked in the way of the doors. I was about to tell them the stable was closed for the day when I noticed that one of them was armed. I could see the handle of what looked to be a firearm sticking out of the waistband of one of the men, and before I could hide, they spotted me. Thinking fast, I blurted out the first thing I could think of, Hey, uh, either of you seen a goat running around here? I called out. They looked puzzled for a moment before they finally replied. I didn't know much Spanish at the time, but I did catch the word cabra, which, if you don't know, is Spanish for goat. I shrugged my shoulders a bit, watching the two men before I decided to duck around the corner, pretending to resume my search of the missing goat as I leaned against the wall, straining to hear. The two men talked for a while, and I could hear them trying to open the doors to some of the horse stalls. They were locked though, which thankfully proved to be enough of a deterrent to cause them to leave. I had initially presumed that they were looking for the medicine we keep locked in the storeroom on JC's side of the stable, but it soon dawned on me that these men were looking for my boss's main racehorse his most valuable possession. Thankfully, she was with JC in an entirely different county. 
I stayed there, listening from around the corner for what felt like an hour. The men tried to move the gator before leaving, but had also given up on that, discovering I had taken the keys out of it. They eventually left, and I soon followed after, deciding that minimum wage wasn't worth potentially being injured over, if not worse. It wasn't until nearly six months later, after I'd found another job, that I discovered that my former boss had accumulated an unfortunately substantial amount of debt with some loan shark in Chicago, and then had been caught selling some sketchy things from the stable. It finally clicked what those men were looking for that night. They were looking for my boss and their money. Number two, Don't Be a Security Guard by Richard. To begin, I need to tell you how I ended up working the night shift of a security job at a pharmacy in the middle of nowhere. Being fresh out of high school with no immediate plans to go right off to college, I decided that getting a job would be worthwhile. I live in a small town just off of a highway in the Midwest United States, and when I say small, I mean small, a population of no more than 700. As you can imagine, in such a small community, there aren't too many well-paying jobs, especially for someone with only a high school diploma. Luckily for me, my grandfather owned and managed a 24-7 pharmacy and was more than happy to offer me a decent salary job as a security guard. He called me up one morning and said that he had an opportunity for some cash. For reference, I'm a fairly mesomorphic guy. I stand a little over six foot three, so I wasn't at all intimidated by the thought of doing a hands-on job like that. He continued, telling me that I'd have to work the night shift from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I already was sort of a night owl, so I had no problem being fit into the nighttime shift. He made the job sound easy enough as well. I'd receive a little bit of training from the senior security guard, a quiet man named Don, and all I'd need to do is make rounds around the building, making sure no junkies are trying to steal their prescriptions worth or anything like that. Eager to start, I agreed and three hours later, I started driving to the building. The pharmacy was in a real weird location, 13 miles down the highway from my town. There existed a little strip mall directly off the road. It consisted of my grandfather's pharmacy, a now deserted Burger King, a cheap rundown motel, and a gas station. The pharmacy was the largest of the buildings in the strip mall. It was maybe half the size of your average Walmart, and it was at the far end of the lot, closest to the woods bordering the strip mall and the highway. I arrived at 4.30 in the afternoon. My grandfather and the aforementioned Don were waiting out front and greeted me when I stepped out of my car. After signing some paperwork, establishing direct deposit information, and basic training of how to perform my tasks, use the security equipment and whatnot, I was good to go for my shift. All throughout the training, Don was very quiet. He seemed distant or solemn. He was constantly looking off into the woods bordering the pharmacy. Whenever I tried to follow his gaze, I couldn't see anything. I remember the next part in great detail. Right before it started, my grandfather pulled me aside and told me this in his uncanny country accent. We don't get many visitors out here, son. Still gotta keep your eye out, though. If you see any weird stuff happening, just ignore it. It'll go away on its own. As soon as he finished speaking, he hopped in his pickup and he drove away. Right away, I thought this was weird, but didn't bother questioning him about it, figuring he was just trying to mess with me on my first day. With my shift starting in 30 minutes, I downed a Red Bull to make sure I had enough energy to do the entire 12 hours. Come seven o'clock, only four people were in the building. There was me, Don, who was in the security room working the cameras, 
Margaret, the on-duty pharmacist, and a guy whose name I forget, so we'll call him Jerry, who was Margaret's tech and assistant. I spent my time sitting in the lobby area of the pharmacy at the back of the building, where the desk where you get the prescription filled is. It gave me a good view of the entire store, as the shelves and the aisles were very short, and I was content that I wouldn't miss any criminal activity. Four uneventful hours later, I was pacing around the inside of the building, feeling somewhere between restless and bored. I noticed that we'd had no customers come in yet, but I thought it was normal considering the location of the building and time of day. That's when my walkie-talkie crackled, and I heard Don's monotone voice from the other end. Rick, something moving outside right by the back entrance. Looked like a teenager effing around. Check it out. Over. As soon as he said what he said, and as soon as I registered it, I immediately felt off. I'm not normally freaked out, but I couldn't fathom why a person would be behind an old strip mall in the middle of nowhere at 11.15 at night. Hoping that either Dawn imagined it or the camera glitched, I replied with a quick, on it, and headed to the back entrance of the store. I opened the back door feeling slightly nervous, but I didn't see anything. Not at first, anyway. A single strip of fluorescent lights from above the back door illuminated the parking lot. I looked out over it to make sure nothing was out of the ordinary, and that's when I saw it. Standing maybe 60 feet away, right at the edge of the woods, there was a man, or at least it looked like a man. It was only barely illuminated by the light, so I could make out only its silhouette. But man, was it tall, even from that distance, at least a foot taller than me. My stomach sank, and I felt really unsettled. I did, however, want to do my job and get this impossibly tall dude off the premises. I called out to it with a simple, Hey! Immediately after I said that, the thing took off straight into the woods, disappearing from my sight almost instantly. Trying to rationalize it, I told myself it was probably a bear or something like it, even though the way it moved and stood looked nothing like any animal I've ever seen. Being very unsettled, but wanting to get the shift over with, I headed back inside. This is where things take a turn for the worse. 45 minutes later, it was exactly midnight. I remember because I was on my smartphone when it happened. I was back in the lobby of the pharmacy when I suddenly heard loud noises all around me. I looked up and I saw easily what was the scariest thing I've seen in my life. All the windows, which lined nearly the entire store, exploded all at once, like they were all being crashed through at the same time. There was glass flying everywhere and it felt like a war zone. Thankfully, it only lasted a few seconds. I couldn't see anything that could have caused the event through the now empty window panes. I pinged Don. He didn't answer and once I confirmed that Margaret and the tech were okay, I ran over to his office. Once I got into the security room, what I saw chilled me. Dawn was lying on the ground with broken glass everywhere. His face was covered in red fluid. Apparently, when the glass exploded, it also affected all the monitors in the security room, sending massive splinters of glass into Dawn's face. The monitors all looked like someone threw a grenade at them, they were all totally wrecked. I called an ambulance, and they immediately took Don to the hospital. When the county police showed up, I explained to them what had happened. They would have thought I was crazy if it wasn't for the pharmacy team backing me up. They took our statements, did a quick search around the area, then left, assuring us through forced smiles that it was nothing to worry about. 
Obviously, me and the other pharmacy staff decided to call it a night after that. With all the windows busted, the building was entirely freezing and definitely not presentable to customers at all. We all were unsettled by what happened. I called my grandfather, leaving him a quick message on the phone. Although I'm sure it was somewhat incoherent, as I had no way of properly explaining what had happened, and I was still shaken up. I might have been able to forget about the incident entirely if it weren't for what happened next. After locking up the store, as I was leaving and getting into my car, I noticed there was a figure standing across the parking lot from me, right by the dilapidated burger joint. Since the area was lit with proper streetlights, I could make out more of the figure. I knew it was the same one from before right away because of how tall it was. But being able to see more clearly now, I saw that instead of a foot taller, they were around nine or 10 feet, towering over the entrance to the Burger King. It was on two legs and looked like a person, but definitely was not. It was wearing a massive tattered trench coat with large tears and gashes in the fabric. The best way I could describe the coat was Aiden Pierce style. Cheers if you get the reference. Through the tears, I could make out its skin, a pale gray color, like heavily watered down cement and leathery. It looked almost wet, even though it hadn't been raining. It was walking slowly, deliberately, with oddly bent joints. It was the most horrifying sight I'd ever seen in person. Instinctively, I turned the key in my car, and as soon as the engine flipped over and the charger roared to life, the thing turned to look straight at me, dead center. I swear, I made eye contact with those black, beady eyes. Seconds later, it turned and took off sprinting at lightning speed. The way it ran, it moved more like a bird, but it was impossibly powerful and fast. It disappeared from my view within moments. As soon as it was gone, I floored it home. I drove straight there without stopping, all the while paranoid that the thing was following me. And with legs that long, that would be pretty easy. I got into bed and endured a sleepless night, the entire time imagining footsteps and scratching outside my window. I never did return to the strip mall. To this day, I have no idea what the thing was. I haven't found a single matching creature from science or urban legend that fits its description. No matter how much I try to tell myself otherwise, I don't think that thing was human. I can't help but lay blame on the creature for the shattering of the windows and monitors, though I have no idea how it would have done it, but I don't care to find out. If there's anything to take from this, it would be don't take being a security guard for an isolated place lightly. Know what you're getting yourself into. There's no telling what might happen and what you might see when you're on duty. Number three, Confession of a Security Officer by S.O. Tom. This took place back in the summer of 2007. I had just started working at a security company and was tasked with guarding an apartment building that was under construction. Workers were there until 6 p.m., and I would make sure no one came in and stole any of the equipment or supplies. These apartments were the kind that had stairs on each end that went up and down with open-ended corridors. The doors were aluminum, and that will be important later. Part of my job at the site was to patrol the four stories every hour and make sure all the doors were closed and locked still. At 2 a.m., I left my car, which was seconding as my office, and started to walk around. As I got to the third floor of the second building that night, I felt panic kick in. I didn't know why, but I just bolted out of there, 
I made it down the hall and to the end of the stairs and started jumping down them to get down them faster. I made it back to my car and stayed inside until sunrise, too afraid to do my job after that. When I finally did have the courage to investigate before the morning construction crews came in, I found one of the doors on the third floor had been bent and swung wide open. I went to examine the door and made sure no one was still inside. When I closed it, my stomach dropped. On the inside of the door, there were three deep claw marks, each one about a hand's width apart from the others. Something had torn through the door and done so much damage to it that it had to be replaced. I've never heard anything approaching, and if not for my instincts, I probably would have been just as torn up as the door itself. Number four, My Security Guard Shift by Jeffrey. I've been working as a security guard for a couple of months now, and it's pretty easy and has pretty good pay. Most of the time, honestly, you don't have much to do. I work at an apartment complex. Every so often, I make the rounds, walking around to see if anyone has expired license plates or parked in a spot they're not supposed to. My work hours are from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. Something happened recently to me that has me a bit freaked out. One night, I was doing my job walking around the parking lot until I heard something. It was like screaming, but something was off about it. It sounded more like a beached whale than a person. The screams seemed to be coming from the nearby woods where there was a fence to keep out anyone who wasn't supposed to be there. It took me a few minutes to gather my courage, but when I finally did, I hesitantly walked over to the fence and peeked through the woods trying to find the source of the scream. When I came within 15 feet of the fence, I saw tree branches and bushes moving as if something had just walked away out of sight, something tall enough to brush past tree branches. I tried to get my flashlight on and pointing in that direction fast enough, but I only caught a brief glimpse of movement. For as long as I worked there after that, I never did hear the scream again and I never did find out what it was that made that noise. Number five, a security guard's creepy story by Anonymous. I work as an unarmed security guard in the state of Utah, where this experience took place about a month ago. I work graveyard shifts at a 14 building, 90 acre office near a state park and mountain range. At the very far west side of the property, there is a line of trees and forest separating a neighborhood and the office park's property. And to the north, there is a bike trail with forest on both the east and west sides. At night, the parking lots are very dark with street lights set up about 60 feet apart. That being said, it makes this forest area extremely dark during the night. One of these nights, I was out on my patrol, shining my flashlight into the thick wooded area. As I was scanning the tree line for any trespassers or teenagers having a little fun, my most common sight, my light happened upon a set of bluish white eyes. This place is a very hot spot for deer to roam, and at first I assumed it was a deer. I quietly got a little bit closer, trying to get a better look at it just to be sure. What I saw was no deer, rather something crouching down. It was covered in fur and it was trying to hide, despite me obviously seeing it. It was large, a little bit bigger than a bear, but much more defined and muscular. I stayed in my security car, just staring at this bulky creature of the night, wondering to myself, what in the world kind of animal is that? I'd never seen anything like it on the property. I was both scared and curious. After two minutes of us glaring at each other, 
with this thing thinking that it was still hiding. It let out a bone-chilling growl, then turned and bounded off into the forest. I floored it back to the property, where the streetlights made me feel safe again, and for the rest of the week, I stayed away from the forests. Maybe it was just a bear, but maybe not. Either way, that creature appeared to be hunting, and it had its eyes set on me. If you're gonna be a security guard, take my advice, and stay aware of your surroundings at all times. Number six, Creepy Bathroom Guy by Detailed Pig LOL. I work in a small local grocery shop as a security guard at night. I'm the type of guy that hates having to use public bathrooms, so it's always a surprise when you go in one. Anyway, the other night officer, let's call him Bob, was sick so it was just me on the lookout. Now, I hate my job, and I only work there for the money, because I mainly have to check the bathrooms, which I've already said I dreaded. It was night, and I was just doing some extra restocking for the guys that work there when I heard something fall in the bathroom. I thought it was toilet paper, but then I heard heavy breathing. I was instantly freaked out, I went to check, hoping to God that it was just a broken pipe or something. I pulled out my flashlight as the bathroom lights didn't work at the time. Just a few seconds after rounding the corner and entering the door to the bathroom, I dropped my torch in shock. There was this creepy dude with a hoodie covering most of his face. He was extremely skinny like the pictures of starving people you've seen in a National Geographic or something, and he was wearing black jeans. When I entered, he snapped his head towards me and pulled out a large kitchen knife, but luckily I had my phone. I kept my distance from him, called my boss, who then called the cops. I pulled out a can of pepper spray and told him not to move or I was going to use it, but he didn't care. He approached me, one clumsy, melancholy step at a time, swinging that blade around, trying to cut me through for whatever reason. As the pepper spray got him in the face, the man didn't even twitch or react to it, and I found myself running until the police arrived. It felt like an eternity, but I was finally safe. They arrested the guy, and they ended up giving me a raise and the next few days off. I think they felt bad for me, as that was the worst security incident we'd had. The following story was featured in a previous video, but fits perfectly here, and I know you will like it. Number seven, Always Check the Doors, by Mr. Ace 44. In 2011, I started my new security post in the insurance district of Hartford. That area has its share of old historic buildings, and my building was no exception. It was an early 1900s mansion that was converted into offices inside. But when I say converted, I really mean just desks placed in some old rooms. One night, around 1 a.m., I grabbed my torch and started my first round. I was, of course, nervous, as I had heard your classic ghost stories from the rest of the guards. As I came to the top of the main staircase, the extremely dim lighting did nothing to help calm my nerves. Door by door, I walked down, checking to make sure they were locked. I remember thinking, this isn't so bad. I'm already almost done with this round. Everything seemed to be going well until I got halfway down the hall. That's when the door on the right was wide open. As I walked over and glanced inside, my heart sank. I began to sweat, wondering if this was even real. Sitting center in the room was a child no more than six years old. He was in the dark, playing with some toys. 
I continued fast paced down the hall, ignoring what I had just seen, thinking, am I going insane? The stories, they're just getting to me, right? I tried to shake it off and I told myself my mind was just playing tricks on me and that I need to go back and close that door. And when I do, if I look inside, there won't be anyone in there. I walked back, trying to force out a laugh to laugh it off and relieve myself. But my heart was beating harder and harder by the second. When I came to the door again and I looked inside, the boy was still in there. I was at a loss for words, barely able to breathe. Nervously, I muttered, Hello? The child turned around and nervously asked me with a sad face, Have you seen my mom? As calmly as I could, I took the child by the hand, trying to comfort him, and brought him downstairs to the security desk to call the police. I couldn't have been more relieved. It was just a lost child. How he got in the building, I don't know. I was just glad there was nothing to be afraid of. As we waited on the police, the child didn't say much and didn't seem too concerned. The cops arrived in only a few minutes. Turns out his mother worked at the office and had brought him into work that day and simply forgot about him. And it baffles my mind how a parent could go five hours not realizing they had abandoned their child. I continued working there for a few months and eventually got a transfer to a new post. At the end of the day, I'm happy everything turned out okay. And most of all, I'm thankful it wasn't a ghost. But you gotta admit, seeing a kid playing with toys in the middle of the dark, it would creep anyone out. Number eight. Those were not reflectors. By Ton Ton Tom. I've worked at this job site for a bit more than a year, and I went from working days to nights. This story happened very recently. It was November 21st, 2017. Specifically, I worked security at a chemical plant located near a river. The plant is about 15 square miles. To the south runs the river, and there is a berm there at the edge of a field to the northeast. On cold mornings like today, a fog rolls in from the river and blankets everything. As you read on, you will see why I explain this. My first duty when I get in is to get in the company vehicle, then patrol the plant and surrounding area. As I was patrolling, I was on the opposite side of the feed of the berm. Shining a light across the area, I saw the reflectors of construction vehicles through the fog. Then I saw what I thought was a set of reflectors from construction vehicles that really caught my eyes. They set atop of the berm, two large red circles from three to five feet apart, and they were connected to a shapeless mass. I thought it was the reflectors of a trailer, and they were parked somewhere it shouldn't be, as it was illegal to park there. I kept slowly driving towards it. As I shine the light around again, the reflectors seemed to follow me, and I simply thought it was a trick of the eyes. Or it could have just been multiple sets of reflectors on the trailer. That was pretty common. The reflectors eventually disappeared, and I chalked it up to something getting between my light and the trailer. I kept going, and after finishing my patrol, which makes a circle, I went back to the field across the berm. I had to unlock a nearby gate to allow first shift employees into their areas. The fog had cleared up enough that I could see the berm more clearly, but I couldn't see any trailer on it. So I shined my searchlight there again. There were no reflectors anymore, and there was no trailer. This frightened me a bit, because the only way someone would be able to get a trailer in or out of the area was to drive past me through the gate, the gate I had just unlocked. Whatever it was, was no trailer. The only thing that makes sense was that they were eyes, and if that's the case, this thing would have been big. Number nine, 
A Wandering Spirit by Tom. I work the third shift as a security guard. I was at a location in a small town for about two months. There was a main building and a small guard building outside of it, in which everyone had to pass through to get to the other building. My nights consisted of watching the CCTV monitors, and on nights when no one else was around, I would patrol the outside area and the inside of the building. One night, I was looking through the camera footage as it played live when I saw what appeared to be an orb appear on camera outside the side of the guard building. I thought it was a bug or something until I realized it was just floating there. I looked out to see if there was a puddle of water reflecting a light or something like that, but my area had been in a draught for a while and there hadn't been rain in days. I wrote it off as a camera glitch until I saw a mist-like figure appear to be standing directly across the little road that ran past the shack. I looked out the window to the exact spot, but from my view, I saw nothing there. I grabbed my cell phone and started recording with my camera, a big no-no when working security, and filmed the figure on the screen for a bit. Suddenly, the orb disappeared, and the figure soon followed. This was not anything more than creepy, and I messaged the video to my fiancé and her sister. They thought it was nothing, just an effect of the nearby lights. They convinced me to write it off, until Saturday, October 8th of 2016. I was watching the monitors again late at night, after finishing a patrol. As I watched the main buildings, the motion sensor doors opened, then, without anything stepping out, they closed by themselves. I looked over at the camera feed. There was no wind blowing leaves, no animals, no reason the door's motion sensor would go off. Immediately, I was filled with a dreadful feeling like I was being watched. Then, the clicking started. It sounded like someone was flipping the light switches on and off. Immediately, I was filled with a dreadful feeling like I was being watched. And then the clicking started. It sounded like someone was flipping the light switches on and off. The lights, however, weren't turning on and off with the noise. Then I realized it was coming from the other side of the dropped ceiling. Then another started, and another. The noise multiplied until there was about six different clicking noises in the ceiling, all out of sync and moving around in there. I reached into my pocket and grasped my multi-tool. I convinced myself not to give in to the fear, so I did not leave or even look between the noises. As suddenly as they all started, there was just one last click and it all went silent again. The fear and dread left and I sat there nervously watching the cameras again until my relief showed up. I've experienced a lot of strange things in my life, but this takes the cake. And number 10, Locked Doors by Mike P. I'm a field manager for a private security company in Connecticut and I have had my fair share of creepy experiences from the dozens of accounts I've worked at, but this one was the worst. I received a call from my branch manager one late Saturday night, explaining to me that one of the officers would not be making it to his assigned shift that evening, and he needed me to go over there right away. I reluctantly agreed, but before I could finish, he interrupted abruptly, saying, off the record, Oh boy, I thought, what crazy backstory is there now? Things are never simple in the security industry. He explained to me that the other officer was injured the night before, and he was claiming it was due to, quote unquote, paranormal activity. I laughed at him, telling him I loved the paranormal, and that I'd be more than happy to work this haunted post. Fast forward. I arrive at this large-sized factory and get the brief rundown from the guard on duty, stating that during the weekend, 
No one is allowed on the property due to concern over employee theft of metals in the building. I was given the keys to the security trailer, located outside the building along with a key fob to the building. The remaining guard left after that, and I sat in the trailer for a good two hours, until my boredom and curiosity got the better of me. Lighting a cigarette, I stepped out of the trailer making sure to test the key behind me before fully locking it. With success, I crossed the windy parking lot to the other side of the factory. Upon entry, it brought me to a small dark room with a door on the far side. I proceeded to the second door, opening it, slowly bringing me into the main floor of the factory. It was strange, though. I thought that the second door was somewhat backwards with the lock on the factory side of the door. So once again, before letting it fully shut, I tested my key to ensure that I would be able to exit. As I walked through the dimly lit factory, which smelled of rubber and oil, I made my way to a pile of crates when I heard it. <laughs> I froze in my tracks, and my heart seemed to stop for a moment. In that moment, I couldn't believe how stupid I was to walk into a factory my superiors outright said was haunted. I managed to collect my thoughts and say sternly and loudly, Security, show yourself! And as I expected, nothing but silence filled the room. I stood there for a moment, sweating, trying to look for any explanation for that noise. But then it came again. <laughs> that was it for me. I was out of there. I kept my mind clear and retracted my steps, coming around the corner to the door I had entered from. I calmly went for my keys, and I placed the key in the lock, turned it, and nothing. The door wasn't even budging, and again and again I tried, but it wouldn't work. But the coughing, it was getting closer. <laughs> By then, I thought, screw it, and I ran through the factory until I found a fire escape. Then I made my way out. Running across the windy parking lot felt like an eternity, but I finally made it back to the security trailer. I pulled out my keys, fitting them into the lock, and again, the door didn't budge here either. What in the world was going on? For 30 minutes, I stood in the cold, continuously trying to unlock the door until I gave up, and I kicked the door in, which I must admit was pretty fun. I'm still puzzled at what kind of force or entity is in that factory, but I sure hope I don't find out, and I most certainly won't be returning at night anytime soon. It's so good to be back, everyone. If you didn't know, I've been on vacation for the past few days, and that's why there's only been single-story uploads. But now I'm back, and I'm ready to scare the bejesus out of everybody. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to share it and leave a like. Also, what do you think the creepiest job would be? If you want to support my channel further, you can go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails and donate any amount to get your name in the credits at the end of the videos. Or you could get my merch at morbidmonsters.com or by clicking the shop button below. If you don't have any extra cash, you can still support me for free by downloading my free app Spooked off the Google Play Store. It has all my stories and my videos in one place. Anyway, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous full video about 10 disturbing confessions from cops. Maggot Bam Bam 100 says, did I make it to my narrator's video fast enough? Yes, you did. By the way, when does season two of Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid come out? I'm asking for a, a friend. Bramble Chaser says, the Twilight Zone can be scary, but it's not focused on being scary was the point. The Twilight Zone tries to make you think, so there ends up being a few scary episodes, but if you want an anthology series where every episode is meant to chill you, you should watch Tales from the Dark Side. Manuel Trujillo says, 
finally one of the best moments of my day. You still have to let me know about the Central American stories, hombre. I'm working on it. That region is too rich in culture not to be discussed horror-wise. Hmm, south of the border monsters. Sonia Rodriguez says, I didn't think you'd look like this with your voice. Uh, just let it out. People keep giving me crap over my face and my glasses. You know, no matter how popular or big you get on YouTube, for me anyway, it still makes me sad when people make fun of me. I'm not saying you are, but there were plenty of other comments, and there always are comments whenever I show my face. But I've got a beautiful wife and 326,000 subs and growing, so I'm doing something right. And Luna Noir says, my unhealthy addiction is fed once more. Does this make me a dealer or an enabler or both? Anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching another episode. More are coming soon and I can't wait to bring them to you. Let me know in the comments what future topics you want me to cover. And here are the credits to my patrons who continue to donate and just be generally awesome. Until next time, guys, this world is a strange one. So stay safe out there and stay creepy.